My pleasure to moderate this panel on understanding genocide across time and space. But first, I have to send the, the regrets of the dean of the Honors College who was called away and who was going to be moderating in my place. Uh, so hopefully, uh, um, I will do as good a job as, uh, as Dean uh, Jackson Elmore normally does in this role. I'm a uh, professor in the School of Human Resources and Labor Relations, and <clears throat> I'm connected to the Honors College specifically to aid the dean in this program, uh, which is called Sharper Focus, Wider Lens. We do a number of uh, these presentations each semester that are based on the idea of using MSU faculty on a panel to really uh, uh, cover an important topic from uh, multiple perspectives, and you're going to definitely uh, see that tonight. Before I go any further, though, let me uh, thank all of the co-sponsors and then uh, introduce our panel and uh, really uh, get this uh, kicked off. Uh, co-sponsoring tonight, along with the Honors College, which is the primary sponsor of the Sharper Focus Wider Lens series, are the Departments of Anthropology and Teacher Education, the School of Criminal Justice, the uh, Jewish Studies and Peace and Justice Studies programs, the Centers for African Studies, Asian Studies, and the Center for Integrative Studies in Social Science. So let me suggest a couple of quick ground rules. First of all, cell phones are really uh, great uh, things to have in one's pocket. It's especially good when they're on uh, either vibrate or on silent uh, during a program like this. I always find it interesting what kind of ringtones people have, but it's kind of, unless they really fit in well with the program, it's uh, problematic. So do uh, turn those off if you would, or put them on vibrate. Second ground rule tonight is the way that this panel works is we're going to hear from each of the faculty members uh, individually. Then I'm going to open it for just some quick crosstalk across the panel. Then we're going to open it to you in the audience, and we'll have a microphone floating around out there with you to make sure that we capture your uh, questions. Um, we like this to be very, very respectful as, a, as an environment. That is, this is a collegial environment that we're trying to build here tonight. So we hope that we all try to keep our remarks uh, um, civil and at the same time also make sure that uh, they're brief uh, to try to make sure we get as many questioners in as we can. So let me uh, introduce the panel, uh, not necessarily in the order that they'll speak. I'll go into that in a moment. But uh, starting on my right is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Beth Drexler. And Beth is uh, with the Department of Anthropology and also coordinates peace and justice studies here on campus. On my immediate right is uh, Dr. Ken Walser. Ken uh, is uh, one of the, the greatest uh, jewels on this campus, has been an eminent uh, professor in both uh, James Madison uh, College and in Jewish studies uh, for a long time, and he's just a, just a great uh, colleague and great friend. On my uh, immediate left is Laura Apol, and Laura is one of the, uh, uh, frankly, best published and uh, finest poets that we have here on campus, as well as being a professor of uh, teacher education. And then on my uh, uh, far left is uh, Christine um, Dijon, who is with the School of Criminal Justice and also coordinates for the College of Social Science, the Center for Integrated Studies in Social Science. So you have four wonderful panel members tonight uh, on this topic of understanding genocide across time and space. So let me just make uh, some quick introductory uh, uh, remarks uh, in terms of the topic and then talk for two seconds again about the setup and then uh, have uh, each of the colleagues uh, talk in order, and I'll pr present that order in a moment. So genocide is a word used to describe a broad category of activities involving, quote, the deliberate and systematic destruction in whole or in part by a state or group of another uh, ethnic, racial, religious, or national group, unquote, including killing members of the group, causing members serious bodily or mental harm, deliberately inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring physical destruction of the group, 
or imposing measures intended to prevent births in the group or forcibly transfer children to another group. The crime of genocide is defined under international law since 1948. You can see the uh, United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide for that. And the crime, sadly, has continued to occur with impunity up to today, including the Nazi genocide of the Jews, the Hutu destruction of the Tutsi in Rwanda, the plight of victims in Cambodia, Bosnia, East Timor, Western Sudan, the Darfur, uh, Darfur and others. So the panelists tonight are all MSU faculty members diverse in their disciplinary training and background who work on subjects and projects that involve or are related to the study of genocide. Each will speak briefly for 10 to 12 minutes about their work in the broader subject. Panelists will then uh, comment further and will open up to questions and discussions with the audience. So we're going to start uh, on my immediate left with uh, Dr. Laura, Laura Apol from uh, Teacher Education, who's going to tell us about writing stories from the 1994 genocide of Tutsis in Rwanda as a form of healing and of witness. Thank you, John, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm excited to be part of this conversation. Um, I don't come here as a scholar of Rwanda or the history of Rwanda, but rather I'm here as a writer and um, a teacher of writing, and the kinds of stories that I'm talking about tonight actually are, are, are twofold. Um, the stories written by survivors um, that tell of their own experiences as a means of facilitating healing, as well as my own writing as a poet um, in response both to the stories that I was told and as a way of working through my experiences in Rwanda. Um, I'm going to give you a really brief um, overview just to remind you of um, some of what happened as part of the history of the genocide in Rwanda. Um, you can see up there the geography that Rwanda is bordered by Congo, um, Uganda, Tanzania, and Burundi. Um, it's a landlocked country there in East Central Africa. Um, and I'm very quickly going to go through the uh, historical understanding of the Hutu and Tutsi because um, actually it's important to understand that these um, ethnic divisions are actually constructs that did not start out being ethnic divisions in Rwanda. Um, there have historically been three groups of people in Rwanda, the Twa who are hunters and gatherers and live in the forests, um, the Hutu who were farmers, and the Tutsi who were owners of cattle. Um, Hutu and Tutsi were permeable designations and boundaries based on economics, not ethnicity. So if you were a particularly good farmer and you acquired cattle, you, would move, you could move from the category of Hutu to Tutsi. And likewise, if you, had, um, if you lost your cattle and returned to farming, you could move from Tutsi to Hutu. Um, the Hutu and Tutsi intermarried, they shared rituals, language, and religion, lived in harmony, and there was social mobility that moved through the groups. Um, with the arrival of um, the Europeans, some of these designations moved from being economic to being ethnic designations. So in 1890, Rwanda was considered to be part of German East Africa at the Conference of Brussels, and then after World War II, um, after World War I, I'm sorry, um, Rwanda was transferred from Germany to Belgian colonial administration. And the um, emphasis in Europe and among Europeans about race and um, ethnicity led them to conclude that, in fact, Hutu and Tutsi were um, ethnic designations and that, um, that the Tutsi who um, were taller and thinner um, and lighter skinned actually were more European and therefore more um, appropriate to give power in ruling too. Now, historically, the Tutsi were the ruling class because they were ethnically more privileged, but this now became a way of understand, being understood in terms of ethnicity. Um, identity cards were then issued based on ethnicity and instead of these being permeable boundaries, these became fixed ethnic boundaries. Um, the, ide the ideology of difference then, ethnic difference, was used by the Europeans to create hatred and jealousy and fear between the two groups 
as a way to gain and maintain power. Um, and from that point, a history of Rwanda was written backward <coughs> to explain and justify and historicize the existence of these ethnic distinctions. Um, in the 50s and 60s then, Rwanda gained independence from Belgium, had a democratic election in which the Hutu majority elected a Hutu government, um, which exacerbated the ethnic tensions because now instead of the Tutsi, rule, the Tutsi class ruling, the Hutus were the rulers and um, there was some retaliation against the Tutsi oppressors in the form of massacres, um, <clears throat> some exclusion of Tutsis from um, political power and um, refugees from the from the Tutsi refugees fled to the um, edges of Rwanda out to Uganda and where they formed um, the young men formed what became known as the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Um, the diaspora, the the refugees to Uganda sought to come back to um, Rwanda. They wanted to come back to their country, but the Hutu government um, was in conflict, um, didn't want them to come back, so they staged attacks, and whenever the RPF would come in asking um, and pressuring for the diaspora to return to Rwanda, there would be massacres of Tutsis in response that were government-led. So along the way, there are several small um, what might be termed genocides um, that were ethnically motivated um, in response to RPF pressure to come back into Rwanda. In 1993 then, in the in Arusha, um, Tanzania, there are, were arranged the Arusha Accords. The president of Rwanda negotiated in order to do some power sharing, um, but um, the, the negotiations were interrupted in 1994 when um, the president's plane was shot down in Kigali. And that was, of course, the start of the genocide. The genocide was a planned and organized killing. It was not spontaneous. Um, it intentionally included civilians. Women and children, as you heard, were especially targeted. Um, schools and churches that had in the past been safe places during previous massacres became sites for the worst atrocities. and. Um, it was the most efficient and concentrated ground level genocide in the 20th century with 800 to a million Tutsis and moderate Hutus being killed in 100 days. The international response, um, the UN was already on the ground to provide a safe transition of government um, according to the plan, the Arusha Accords, um, but at that point the UN pulled out. Um, France was the only country to bring in troops, but they were in support of the Hutu government and the Catholic Church was also in support of the Hutu government. So in the project that I was doing, um, I went into Rwanda um, and used writing stories as a form of healing among teenage um, orphans of the genocide. The history of the project was that um, a friend of mine and a person at, at MSU and in East Lansing, Ken Bialik, went to Rwanda, um, met with a woman who had, whose family had been saved she had hidden her family and had, um, had told God that if God saved her family, she would do God's work for the rest of her life. And so Rose um, was responsible for about 2,000 orphans of genocide that she was um, providing medical care for, um, education and so on, with her daughter Glorius, who was a psychiatric nurse. Um, Glory said to Ken, we can take care of a lot of the needs of the orphans, but no one's taking care of their psychological and emotional needs. Um, so Ken and I went back and met with Rose and Glory and planned a project um, together where they wanted us to work with high school aged orphans um, using narrative writing for healing and creating children's books and curriculum. Um, we went back for a third visit then and trained facilitators, you can see them there and I've listed their names but I won't um, I won't list them all out since the time is going quickly. Um, so we trained them, um, so they participated in a workshop format as well as trained to run the workshop themselves. And then two years later, we went back and interviewed them about what they were doing and how. The project had several stages then. We designed the workshop, we trained the facilitators, we conducted the workshops, we revised the narratives that came out of the workshops and created a literature. We took, the work took place at the Kigali Genocide Museum, and you see us there. Um, 
And we had a three-step project. So we started by having people write about their pre-genocide experiences, um, then going into the trauma of genocide and writing about that, and then finally writing about where they were post-genocide. This was, of course, a decade after the genocide. So their lives had resumed to a certain extent. And within that process, they did some free writing as well as some narrative writing in two stages. And so you can see that it went from private writing to more public writing to um, very much more public writing. At the same time, I was writing. And um, so the second part, the telling stories as a form of witness, I've written my own um, collection of poetry, which I've just completed, called The Back Door of Heaven, um, Poems Out of Rwanda. I took two trips. Um, on one, in one of them, in 2010, I wrote poems. And in the other, I also used one of the survivor stories to create a novel for children. Um, the challenges for me in telling stories as a form of witness as an outsider was, of course, accuracy, um, how to have artistic and aesthetic integrity in the work that I was doing, um, negotiating the literal and the literary truth um, in the work that I was doing, bringing my perspective as an outsider into the conversation without um, taking over the experience or the voices of other people, so owning that this experience was my own. Um, I needed to be careful of the risk of seeming to speak for others and avoid exploitation, voyeurism, and sensationalism. So what I'd like to do in conclusion is just to share a poem from that collection. This is the opening um, poem. And it's called The Lives of Others. Um, it opens with a head note by the poet Jane Hirschfield that says, we know nothing of the lives of others. Under the surface, what strange desires, what rages, weaknesses, and fears. Nothing is only itself. In each brick, a story of mud, grass, and sun. In each tree, a story reaching back to its roots. The seed of the avocado carries out to the world what its leaves have taken in. A young girl hides a coin in the oleander, saying aloud her prayer or wish or incantation of rage. Notice the curved flute of the calla lily, how it rings the flower's center, like the scar around the sightless eye of Jean de Dieu, who each morning brings me coffee, milk, and two hard-boiled eggs. Miracose, thank you, I say to the flower, to the man, to the milk and eggs. Miracose to the brick and tree and buttery fruit. Miracose to the girl bent over the bushes begging hands. But I mean to say more. I mean to say this. Each story holds a question that is more than itself. And each story is its own answer, knowing nothing. What can I do but listen? Well, first round of applause. <laughs> we'll now uh, turn to my right, and uh, my uh, colleague uh, Ken Walser will be going second tonight. I'm going to begin from where Laura left off with the telling of stories, um, both for purposes of healing and purposes of witness or history. I'm working on a book on the rescue of children and youths inside a concentration camp during the Nazi genocide. Rescue is usually thought of as keeping people outside of concentration camps, so it doesn't usually go here. And children are usually not thought much at all thought of much at all regarding the Nazi concentration camps. 90% of European Jewish children died during the genocide. Um, and basically, it's thought if they were taken to a, to a death camp or a concentration camp, the chances of them surviving were almost nil. 
Uh, if they were under a certain age, they were sent directly to the gas. If they were close enough in uh, uh, age to work, 16 years old, uh, they might survive for a time, but they might uh, likely die from overwork. Um, they were also thought of by the Nazis as useless eaters, not to be kept around. And yet, when General Patton's U.S. Third Army liberated Buchenwald near Weimar, Germany, in April 1945, American soldiers found nearly 1,000 boys among the 21,000 surviving prisoners. Most were adolescents, as in the top picture, um, but they included many younger children as well. The two youngest are shown there at the bottom. They were four years old each. So I'm trying to answer the question, which nobody bothered to ask in the last 60 years, how were these boys still alive to be liberated? Who were they, what had been their experience, and what had happened to them in the camp to sustain their lives until the American soldiers arrived? Now, to enter into the dark world of the concentration camps and to study human behavior in extremity amidst genocide, you might ask, how do historians write the story of genocide and slave labor? How do we know what we know? How do we find out? And it may surprise you to know that reliance on the testimonies of survivors like the kinds of people Laura was working with in Rwanda, uh, reliance on survivor memory is usually not at the center of what historians do. It's not at the center of historians' research. Uh, they don't use it to research, reconstruct, and tell the story. Survivor memory is thought of as unreliable and tainted, and as influenced by all that the survivors have experienced between the point of the trauma of victimization and the time of the retelling. And yet, on the other hand, we've just lived through a period of a remarkable awakening of survivor memory from the Holocaust. We have archives filled with testimonies. The Spielberg archive at USC is filled with 50,000 testimonies, stories, witnesses, um, by these people sharing their experience. And so there are historians who are beginning to think contra other historians a little bit differently about the uses of survivor memory and testimony. They're thinking that survivor memory can be the basis for writing good history and for finding out information that is otherwise not available. I'm one of those kinds of historians. What I want to do is, those are some of the younger children. I want to tell you four basic positions that divide historians about using survivor testimony. One position opposes using it at all. And in fact, uh, there are presses that will reject your manuscript if you rely over heavily on survivor testimony. The historian Isfan Dayak, a very fine historian at Columbia, for example, writes that survivor memoirs and testimonies follow predictable narratives. They begin with the idyllic life before the rupture, uh, the juncture. Um, they go over the disaster and the wanton destruction of genocide, and then they finally return to life and the creation of new life in the aftermath of genocide. In a sense, he's saying they're predictable. They follow a form. And these retellings, he says, are often embellished by selective memory. They skirt or they sentimentalize issues like personal behavior and human conflict among victims in the camps. And they seldom enter the area that Primo Levi has called the gray zone, the area of murky moral ambiguity, where privilege and questionable behavior were traded under difficult conditions for protection or for well-being. Dayak emphasizes that we must comprehend that the environments of genocide, ghettos, camps, were worlds of social hierarchy, privilege, and terrible internal conflict. And there was a death struggle among victims amidst the genocide. And we just don't hear much about that in survivor memory. Survivors don't remember and tell what they did wrong. They only tell what they did to help themselves survive. Another position articulated by a writer by the name of Susan Brisson cautions that survivor memoirs and testimonies we should understand are not merely recollections of the past, but they're also outcomes of active survivor efforts in the present long after the events of the past to master deep trauma and master deep loss in their lives. 
and to reintegrate what are unintegrated or split lives, the life now and the life then. So these are efforts, this writer says, to link life long ago, disrupted life, the life of pain and loss, with life today, the life that continues. As such, they are exercises in identity making or reintegrating of selves, and they are efforts at personal healing in the present rather than attempts at history from the past. Working through remastering traumatic memory involves reclaiming the self as a subject and remaking the self. Ba basically, um, what this writer is saying is that these retellings, excuse me, th these retellings are tainted by their therapeutic purposes. Um, they cannot be relied on as evidence for history. Now, a third position is different than the previous two in the sense that historians who take this position are willing to use survivor testimony. They basically say survivor testimony can take us into dark places where otherwise the documents don't take us. They can take us inside a ghetto. They can take us inside a camp. They can take us into a children's barrack at Buchenwald. But these writers caution that that memory or that testimony that is best is that that memory that was taken right after the events in the post-war period between 1945 and 1950 and was written down and preserved and that's the best we can. That when we use testimony taken more recently, <laughs> like all those Spielberg archive testimonies taken in the 1990s, in fact, many of them in three years, 1994 through 1996, that's 50, 60 years later. And everything in between works to corrupt and diminish the value of those testimonies. Um, so that people insinuate what they learned from Schindler's List into their memory. They insinuate what they saw on a TV show, or what they read in another memoir into their own memory. And so memory is no longer as pristine or as powerful as some historians think it should be. Finally, there is coming into view today a final fourth view, which emphasizes firmly that survivor memoir and testimony are crucial to taking us into the places where otherwise we will never be able to go, about which the Nazis wrote their documents with obfuscating language, and they tell us what it was like to go through the actual experiences of genocide. Uh, historians like Christopher Browning acknowledge that survivor memo memoirs and testimonies are s properly suspect as narrated memory. They're selected, they're organized, they're worked into story form. But nonetheless, he believes when you take lots of them and you work with them together as collected memories, Basically, you can read them with one another and against one another and in a comparative way such that they are proved to be quite reliable and quite revealing. And in fact, these historians are beginning to realize with psychologists that traumatic memory is quite enduring and stable over long periods of time. These people may not remember what they had for lunch yesterday, but they remembered what they had for lunch on a passenger train that took them from one camp to another. My own view based on my work tracking these children who were 16 and under in April 1945 who are today elderly men in their late 70s and early 80s and spread all over the world, the US, Canada, Australia, France, Israel, and elsewhere, is that survivor memory, memoirs and testimonies, and interviews can be remarkable sources for uncovering a story that went untold and unresearched for 60 years. That memory they have has proved surprisingly stable and enduring over long periods, and regardless of where they live and what kind of survivor community, they have uh, begun to break their silence and speak their testimonies, they basically tell the same story. And so what's that story? What happened in Buchenwald? What explains 
why there were nearly 1,000 children alive to be liberated when the U.S. Third Army finally showed up? The answer is that there was a rescue operation inside the camp, an effort by the German communist-led international underground to protect youths. Why? Because youths were the future. They were the raw material to build a new society after the collapse of the Nazi regime. And helping the, them, for these men, veteran prisoners in the camp, was a way of resisting the Nazis, resisting their own dehumanization, and resisting apathy. The camp had become so large in size and scale during the war, and so diverse, a polyglot babble inter in internally, that the Nazis needed a middle management, and the German communist-led underground became the force that cooperated with the Nazis and ran the camp in accordance with Nazi specifications. They lived and acted in a gray zone. But at the margins of cooperation and collaboration with the Nazis, these veteran prisoners protected their own. That was first priority. And secondly, they protected children who arrived in huge numbers on transports after transports during 1944 and 1945. They arranged to keep many of them in the base camp at Buchenwald rather than transport them to the outer camps where the work was killing. They stashed them inside Buchenwald in clusters in children's barracks that were overseen with tough love by tough members of the underground. And if you misbehaved, you were cracked down upon. They secured for these boys extra food and clothing. They arranged for the roll calls that the Nazis required to come into the barracks so that they were protected against the weather. And to control and discipline them and to transport their minds away from the realities of Buchenwald, they created clandestine schools inside the barracks at Buchenwald. Imagine that schooling in a concentration camp. They instituted schooling as a form of discipline and resistance. How do I know? Because in addition to the German camp documents themselves, which track the movements of the boys 16 and under, sometimes 17 and under, into the camp and into particular barracks, what we would call documentary evidence, most of the boys in memoirs and testimonies and retellings in archives and in interviews that I've had with them remember that they were protected and saved. Most remember their mentors by name. They recall the lessons and the songs of the school, and they say where they were watched over and helped to make it until the Americans arrived. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Now we'll turn uh, on my far right to Beth Drexler who will talk about who tells the stories and the implications of that question. Okay. Um, sorry, I apologize for not having a PowerPoint. I'll try to be as dramatic as possible in reading. Um, I'm gonna talk about East Timor, which has been described as a genocide averted by international intervention. I'm only going to have time to map a few key points today, um, and one of those is how considering the circulation of images points to a key issue that is invisible in the legal process, which is the problem of people who play both sides. So I'm going to take you a little further into a gray zone that's more contemporary than we, we just left, so I guess we didn't really leave. Um, a very brief, overly simplified history of East Timor, for those of you who um, do not know the story of East Timor. East Timor is a small half-island country at the edge of Indonesia's sprawling archipelago. East Timor was a Portuguese colony for more than 300 years. In 1975, Portugal granted its colonies independence. In East Timor, different political parties emerged. One of them was socialist in the context of the Cold War. Indonesian President Suharto, quote, got the green light from President Gerald Ford and Henry Kissinger, that they would understand if Indonesia invaded to stop a domino-style spread of communism in Southeast Asia. In the first years of the Indonesian occupation, due to starvation and the military occupations, nearly a third of Timor's population died. 
The UN never recognized Indonesia's illegal occupation of East Timor. Nevertheless, the operations continued until 1999, when, at the height of the Asian financial crisis, um, President Suharto, who was the general who launched the invasion, um, stepped down from power, and his successor decided that East Timor was a pebble in Indonesia's shoe because they were getting so much international pressure, um, granted the Timorese a referendum to decide if they would stay with Indonesia or become an independent country. The UN supervised the vote, but the occupying Indonesian forces were in charge of security. The Timorese overwhelmingly chose independence and the Indonesian forces and, critically, the Timorese militias that were trained by the Indonesian military unleashed what was called a scorched earth campaign, killing almost 1,500 people in less than a month. UN peacekeepers intervened to restore security and some people have suggested averted a genocide at that time in 1999, discounting what happened in the late 70s. Timor became an independent country and multiple trials, tribunals, and truth commissions attempted to come to terms with the violence per perpetrated primarily in 1999, but also some stretching back to 1975. These institutions have supported in various forms the idea that what happened in East Timor was that the Indonesian forces failed to prevent a civil war in Timor in 1999, rather than holding the Indonesian forces accountable for their role in creating that violence. Um, there's been a wide range of representation of violence in East Timor during the Indonesian occupation, including human rights reports, personal testimonies, journalistic accounts, fiction photos, as well as government investigations, resolutions, and reports. A series of puzzling comments pointed my attention to considering how representations of violence were produced during the occupation, as well as after independence. A woman who worked for the armed resistance movement, Falantil, in both the forest and the city, was describing her interactions with the Indonesian special forces, Kapasus. And she said, if he, Kapasus, the Kapasus contact, wants to kill someone, he has a friend make a photo or a video for us. He has all the authority. He can do anything. If the army brings three women to rape, they have to photograph them. Our strategy was like this. I said to him, Kapasus, if you want to kill anyone, make a photograph for me. That was the photo that I sent out. I sent out all the photos that I got. I asked what the photos were used for, and she explained, it's for the diplomatic struggle. They, the outside world, all of us, would say, what war if there was no proof? Ramos Horta, who won the Nobel Prize in 1996, talks outside, so we have to work here to get proof so that the outside can be strong. She gave several examples of smuggling the photos out. She wrapped the photos and put them underneath cookies in a tin that she stowed with her small bag of clothes on the night bus to Indonesian West Timor. In West Timor, she handed the package off to a tourist in a meeting arranged by the outside network and conveyed to her in various code terms. Her comments and others emphasized to me the importance of representing violence and the power to perpetuate violence in the international arena. These remarks also suggest a critical, critical elements about the conditions of possibility for the representation of systematic mass violence. The photograph's content typically overwhelms reflection on their production. Support networks disseminated the images and testimony to an audience prepared to make sense of them. Campaign materials provided context and meaning for the images, as well as suggested follow-up actions. Clearly distinguished protagonists, the repressive state forces, the heroic resistance, and the innocent victims structured the conflict discourse. In this context, certain images would not make sense. A smiling soldier handing over evidence to, the member, to a member of the resistance. Transitional institutions, and by this I mean the trials, tribunals, truth commissions, investigative commissions, and so forth, did not address the gray zone, or what I call problems of collaboration and betrayal, between and within the two forces. A cell system structured the resistance throughout the occupation. It was hard to know who was doing what for the cause. Post-independence institutions have not clarified this. The constantly repeated refrain, it was a time of war, implies spontaneous emotional actions, not calculated decisions, secret acts, and established networks of information and resources. During the occupation, the Indonesian soldiers relied on its informants, festering resentments initiated by political conflicts and extended by betrayal to implement its operations. The statement, Timorese were victims of other Timorese, fails to address how this dynamic created conditions in which mass violence became possible 
and was actually perpetrated. Betrayal and collaboration, oh, that's impossible, um, <laughs> occur through the figure of the Mohu. And I had a lot to say about the Mohu, but um, I'll just get right to a woman that I interviewed. And she told me that her husband worked for the Indonesian intelligence. Many other people had indicated that relatives had worked for the Indonesians to protect their families. So I was surprised when she subsequently commented that her husband had ordered her extensive torture. Our conversation drifted through other topics. The next day, we met again. I asked her if she could tell me more about her husband's work as an intelligent agent, and I asked her if he was a mohu, if he was this gray zone figure. She sighed and said that many people said her husband had helped them in 1999 in the refugee camps. Her husband had at one time worked for the resistance, but he was arrested, spared by a relative who worked with the Indonesian forces and trained as an informant. Eventually, she realized that he had actually become a mastermind for the Indonesian intelligence. In the course of our conversation, she emphasized the complexity of the mohu. There were, she said, two different kinds of mohu, those who tell the TNI, the Indonesian forces, who to kill, and others who work with them and then tell us the Indonesian plan. They tell us, you have to leave here or you will be arrested. In some cases, survival depended on knowing the difference. The TNI assisted Falantil in significant ways. She emphasized, during the 1980s, we would have all died if it were not for the good-heartedness of some of the TNI who, who didn't see or pretended not to see us. She cataloged the contributions of specific military branches for several hours. She said of one soldier who was selling explosives to the resistance, he is a two-headed person. He doesn't like his own government. Official institutions have failed to consider these gray areas and ambiguities that animated and extended violence in the past. And as a side note, I should mention that in all the time talking to her, I always thought of her as a member of the resistance and never thought of her as somebody playing both sides until, of course, much later writing it up, I thought it could very easily look like she was operating in this very indeterminate zone in all of the contacts that she had with the soldiers. A TNI, or Indonesian military, that cooperates with its enemy to sustain an independent struggle obviously contradicts the Indonesian civil war narrative that what happened after the referendum vote was simply a conflict erupting between two different groups of Timorese who were dissatisfied with the referendum results. Holding the military accountable for providing assistance as well as systematic killing is beyond the scope of existing legal institutions, but may be critical in preventing further campaigns to rewrite genocidal violence as civil war in other parts of Indonesia. Okay, prevention of an accountability for genocide requires a nuanced understanding of the conditions in which genocide becomes possible and occurs or does not occur. Accounts detailing the complexity of collaboration and betrayal complicate the demands of advocacy strategies for unambiguously differentiated perpetrators and victims engaged in documental, documented genocidal violence. Such accounts, however, offer greater insight as to the development of the conditions in which genocide occurs and therefore greater opportunities for prevention and advocacy. The term genocide represented a legal in innovation, and greater understandings of the conditions for genocide may contribute to more effective innovations and strategies for preven prevention and accountability or for further legal innovations. The successful rewriting of genocide as civil war in Timor suggests that the challenge of representing genocide may now have more to do with issues of rewritability than deniability. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And our last uh, panelist on my far left again is uh, Christine Dion, and uh, she'll be talking about uh, genocide beyond mass killing. Thank you. I have kind of a loud voice. Is that okay? Everybody hear me? Okay. Thank you, back row. Um, you've heard three different examples tonight of of. Uh, of genocides that have occurred. And, and, and I want to kind of talk about why we call those things genocides. I want to actually go back to where we started. Dr. Beck provided a definition of genocide at the beginning of the program, taken directly from the UN Convention Against Genocide. So the United Nations and member countries got together and created a definition shortly following World War II of what genocide is and what it should be. The US took 
40 years to sign that. But anyway, um, let's continue. So according to the UN, genocide occurs when specific acts are committed, I'm gonna talk about some of those in a minute, with intent to destroy in whole or in part a group based on, see I gotta click it twice, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. So that is the very general UN definition about what genocide is. And the three examples you've heard tonight taken from countries like Rwanda, from East Timor, and also the Holocaust, um, are good examples of what the UN would consider to be genocide, the mass group, or the mass killings rather, of one group by another. And the victimized group is typically portrayed as being undesirable in some way. Scholars debate over what else we can consider genocide. So other acts can or should be considered genocide, such as the current persecution of homosexual men in the country of Uganda. Um, last year, Uganda tried to pass a bill to make homosexuality, uh, excuse me, punishable by death. Um, clearly, there was a lot of outcry about this. Um, part of the bill said that anyone known to harbor a homosexual would receive life incarceration. And well, when I first heard that, I thought, well, when you substitute the word Jew for homosexual, suddenly it seems like we're back in Nazi Germany again. Thanks to an international outcry, this law is currently on hold, but they have launched a massive propaganda campaign in Uganda to get the public behind these laws. Um, they tie homosexuality to national security, saying that being a homosexual is a risk to Uganda's excuse me, national security. Um, they equate homosexuality with pedophilia, saying that male homosexuals will recruit and train and rape young boys to be gay themselves, and they publish, and that is not our Rolling Stone, by the way, totally different thing. Um, they publish the list, lists of names and images of gay men in Uganda in this newspaper, and it has fueled, uh, as you can imagine, a lot of hate against homosexuals, a lot of violence, and in fact, at least one homicide, the killing of David Cato, who was an outspoken activist for gay men in Uganda. This sign is interesting. He was, he was brutally loved to death by Christian missionaries. Many people looking back have tied the writing of this law to a visit by three well-known anti-gay American Christian evangelicals who came to speak to the the government of Uganda about uh, homosexuality and the evils of homosexuality. So some of this unfortunately may come back to the, to the US. Um, so we debate about what, should that be a genocide? I mean, people are being killed because they're seen as being in an undesirable group. But when you think about the definition, according to the UN, homosexuality or sexual orientation is not part of that definition. It only includes nationality, ethnicity, race, or religion. Um, so technically, this is not a genocide, but many scholars would argue that it should be. That is the intentional killing of a group viewed to be undesirable. Now, there are several other acts that Dr. Beck mentioned in his opening statement that constitute genocide that we don't always think about as being genocide because typically we focus on mass killing. However, causing serious bodily or mental harm to group members is also considered genocide. It doesn't have to rise to the level of murder. So as an example, um, I study rape and sexual assault. Rape is a common tool used during genocide to control the population. And we've seen it in every genocide that, that we've studied. In Rwanda, it's especially poignant in that many of the children who are 16 or 17 years old today were conceived as products of rape, of the genocide. And little Thomas here, this is, you know, this is some of the aftermath of widespread rape. His mother says, I hate this child. I can't look at him. He's a bad child. He has bad blood. He reminds me of, of the rape. It's very, very sad. And yet we don't study or pay attention to these after effects of sexual assault, which are always <laughs> part of a genocide um, as far as, as, as we've studied them. 
Deliberately inflicting conditions designed to bring about the group's physical destruction is another condition of that definition of genocide. Again, it doesn't necessarily have to include murder. One of the more modern controversies here is forced relocation. If you force millions of people to march out of your country, is that considered genocide? Well, many of those people are going to be old and weak and are going to die along the way. So there's a huge controversy right now about the Armenian genocide that took place in 1914. The country of Turkey <coughs> took steps to march millions of Armenians out of their country. To this day, the government of Turkey will not acknowledge that that was a genocide. Uh, the United States is one of the few Western countries that has not signed an, an agreement, an awareness that that was a genocide. Um, this can be a little uncomfortable to talk about, but the United States has been party to many of these as well. The forceful marching of Native Americans off of their land into reservations in the West, the Trail of Tears. Um, many would argue that that was a genocide. Again, if you forcefully move an entire group of undesirable people, there are going to be many, many deaths along the way. Imposing measures intended to prevent births. And when we think about this, it's usually about forced sterilization. Now, when I first started studying genocide, I thought of Nazi Germany, when I thought of forced sterilization. And the little propaganda poster here that um, the inferior breed more quickly than the superior. Therefore, the Nazis would argue that you would have to take steps to control this population lest you end up with too many useless eaters, as, as, as Dr. Walter pointed out earlier. But the truth is the United States has been guilty of this as well. In the early 20th century, there was forced sterilization of mentally ill, um, homeless, poor, and mentally retarded people in the hopes of controlling their reproduction. In fact, many women were sterilized without even knowing it. They would go in and give birth and be sterilized while they were under anesthesia if they were deemed to be unfit in some way. Um, so it's important to note that many of these behaviors take place not in what we might think of as a genocidal state or a wartime state, but in peacetime U.S. Here's a, here's a, uh, a flyer from Cincinnati. The feeble-minded are going to cause us many problems because they're going to be in jail and they're going to usurp public services. So there needs to be steps to, to, to limit their, their procreation. And then finally, the UN recognizes the forcible transfer of children from one group to another. This was most obviously seen in Australia when the United Kingdom colonized Australia. Um, there seems to be this intent to want to uplift the savages, right? To show the primitive people all that the West has to offer by forcing their children out of their homes and away from their parents into training schools to teach them English and to teach them the proper way of navigating the world. Um, back to the U.S. of A, taking Native American children from their families forcefully, putting them into training schools, having them remove their native costumes, their native garb, and wear more appropriate, you see my air quotes here, more appropriate clothing, um, learning English and all of those things. If, if you're familiar with Rudyard Kipling's poem, The White Man's Burden, he spoke very eloquently about the, the burden, ironically, that the white man faces to uplift the savages. So this is also part of the UN's definition of what genocide really is. Um, one of the things I teach in my classes is how can we study genocide and learn something about everyday life from that? How can we recognize patterns in our own society that may be dangerous or potentially genocidal? Because it has happened in this country. Well, this is highly controversial, but um, I would argue that some of the actions by the state of Arizona to limit Mexican immigration is a path down the road to genocide. Um, in Arizona, they, they see Mexican immigrants, illegal immigrants in particular, as troublesome populations. They are portrayed in the media as criminals who carry diseases and are, in some cases are less than human. The language used to refer to them, sometimes you hear them talk about dogs or mongrels. These are human beings. So some of the propaganda that's come out of Arizona has been very disheartening. Ray Waters was someone who would not sign the bill um, to really crack down on illegal immigrants. And so she is therefore putting neighborhoods at risk for crime. Now, as a criminologist, I've reviewed this literature, and I can tell you that there is no relationship between immigration and crime. In fact, it's just the opposite of what you might think. Immigration goes up, 
crime goes down. Yet you don't really hear that very much in Arizona. So there's a strong use of propaganda to make their point. Um, one of the things that this law would have allowed would be for officers to stop anyone who appeared to be um, illegal. If they had a reasonable suspicion that someone wasn't illegal, they could stop and ask them for proof of citizenship. Well, those of us who study police and stops and searches wondered what criteria police might use to stop someone. Um, and really, it comes down to skin color that there's not a lot to differentiate illegals from non-illegals in the state of Arizona. So we started to see all kinds of commentary in social media about how do you prove you're a citizen, right? If you're, if you're lily white, welcome to Arizona, have a nice day, otherwise it's show us your papers. Um, and one thing I really appreciated was that the protests, the backlash from this, the people who are Mexican and American who are living in Arizona said, you know, look, we are human. This was the perfect way, I think, to demonstrate against this, to assert their humanity, that it is wrong to be portraying these individuals as criminal, as um, the bringers of disease and filth. The Nazis did that with the Jews and many other groups that were persecuted in World War II. So um, being a paranoid genocide researcher, when I started to see this unfold last year, I thought this has all the makings of a really, really bad event, that the state of Arizona has identified an undesirable group that they would like to be rid of. And I thought, um, if we start hearing things about marching all the Mexicans out of Arizona back across the border, then uh, hopefully the UN would get involved in some way. But most of what I try to do is, is, is look at genocide research as a way to, to stop things from happening in this society and in others. And um, I honestly believe that studying genocide isn't just about studying the events and what really happened, but how can we work to make our society a better place? Even in our own right now peaceful culture, <laughs> what kinds of things might be happening that could potentially lead to genocide? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm sure that all of you are struck by questions. I'm going to ask the panel to react very quickly to each other. But let me just uh, mention a couple of things that came to me, and maybe they came to you as well. I think across the four, we've heard very strongly that our understanding of genocide needs to be dynamic rather than static. That much of the uh, quick uh, black and white understanding of who is a villain and who is a hero has been somewhat confounded by some of the things we've heard tonight about the gray zones, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that when we get into discussion. It also, I think, is very much the case that it's about whether or not we remember or whether or not we move on, and a tension between remembering and moving on that you heard, I think, in, in many of these presentations as well. With that, let me open it up to the panel for a quick crosstalk up here in terms of any comments on each other's presentations. And then uh, we're going to open it up for questions. Any comments up here first that uh, people want to mention? Don't start all at I, once. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can say to Christine, um, the notion of dehumanization as the first step toward genocide is certainly something that happened in Rwanda. One of the first steps was um, when in, in the conflict, in the ethnic conflict, the notion that it was all right to um, call Tutsis snakes and cockroaches, cockroaches and children in schools did this. It, wasn't, it, was, it was something that was encouraged, especially among children. So that's certainly something that resonates through the Rwanda genocide as well. And, and it was broadcast through the media. And it was broadcast as, as through the well. media and, um, on radio and yes. in the newspapers. And I'm happy to say that those people who ran the radio station were, were brought to justice for their role in the genocide because they incited it. They went on their radio show say, stamp out the cockroaches, cut the tall right. trees, and that initiated killings. Other comments up here? Ken? Yeah, I'd like to ask Laura a question. Um, one of the things that struck me in my own work is how silent most survivors were after the genocide, the Nazis, uh, was completed. And for most people, it was 30 years, 40 years before they began telling their story. Um, 
it was too painful. Uh, they wanted to get on with new life. They were counseled to shove it deep down inside them and get on with life. Um, and it took them a long time to talk. And yet here in Rwanda, we hear 10 years after the genocide, there are projects in which um, relatively young people, younger then, but still young, um, are being encouraged um, to give their testimony. And I'm wondering, beyond your own project, what else is going on in Rwanda to encourage people to talk, to provide the audiences for people to talk, and what's the consequence of all that? Well, certainly I think that it's a different world now, given social media, given the proliferation of video cameras um, and recording devices and so on. Um, what was unusual about our project was that we were having people write, but there certainly is a lot of gathering of testimony and um, first-person accounts that are videotaped um, for a variety of purposes. Um, some of them show up in films and documentaries, but also the Genocide Memorial Museum in Rwanda that I had the pictures of in Kigali where we did our, our workshops um, is a repository for a lot of this testimony. So there's a, there is a historical component. There's also a therapeutic component um, because people actually um, are eager to tell their stories. I, I don't think that there's the same reluctance that you're speaking of. I think there's much more sense that if the world is going to pay attention, and of course in Rwanda there was such a huge sense that the world wasn't paying attention, that, that somehow now getting the story out seems to many survivors to be their only hope for making a difference in the world. Other, um, other questions or comments up here before we open it up to the audience? It's just one, one follow-up question. Um, when you say people are eager to tell the story, are these people who are seen as victims or were there perpetrators eager to tell their story as well? I don't think there are many perpetrators. There are certainly people who have gone in to mm -hmm. um, talk to perpetrators and who have gone into the prisons in particular, mm -hmm. um, who have been part of the gachacha movement, mm -hmm. the, um, the, the customary. Yep. Sorry, and uh, so there's there's some of that, but mm -hmm. there's much more silence on the part of the perpetrators than on the part of the victims, for sure. Let me ask one last question of everybody and then maybe open it up uh, out here. I guess that I'm struck by Ken's question about, um, I mean, is a, a good amount of this survivor guilt? Is a good amount of it about why did others die and I was saved? Or uh, is there something I could have done to to change the situation. And especially, you're really pointing out that these are not victims. These are active people in resistance, even inside camps, to, to the future that's laid out for them. So I can imagine that there are folks who could say very much that they did not have any actual survivor guilt, that instead that they were part of an act of resistance that, where they felt that they were affirming life in, in the face of the Nazi genocide. Two, two quick responses. The rescuers never spoke about rescuing. And the reason they didn't speak about rescuing is that they were collaborating with the Nazis. They had been given the franchise to run the internal self-administration of the camp. And they were, member of, they were members of an international communist movement. And they could not tell their brothers, their comrades, when they went back to their, their countries, that, hey, we, you know, we, we ran the camp for the Nazis. Um, so they could never speak about saving children inside the camp. Um, instead, they developed a novel and a myth about the saving of one child. His name was Stefan Yerzy Zweig. Uh, it was a book called Naked Among Wolves, came out in the late 50s. And people in the Eastern Bloc read that book in the same way we read the diary of Anne Frank. And otherwise, um, uh, it wasn't talked about by the rescuers at all. So the way I've discovered all this is by talking to the victims themselves, people who were um, in the camps for a year or two years um, and then survived and were there when, when General Patton's army showed up. And they do have survivor guilt. Um, it's, it's almost impossible to fi find a survivor who isn't plagued by the question, why did you survive? 
but your brother didn't, your father didn't, your mother didn't. 90% of these boys were orphans. So they never escaped the burden that they continued to carry with them. Um, but gradually over time, as people became in the United States more friendly to listening to their stories, um, they began to talk about what happened to them. Um, and often they, 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 they talk about ways in which they did something and that contributed to them surviving while somebody else didn't. But the more you listen to these and you put them in conversation with one another, you realize that this guy says he survived because he didn't go, and this one says he survived because he did go, um, and they're all contradictory, and it becomes, the picture becomes complicated, and you realize that it's fortuitous and it's circumstantial, and it's not really uh, uh, on the part of the agency of the children themselves. Uh, so they were rescued, but the rescuers were quiet, and, uh, and, and now they're still dealing with their own guilt, but beginning to get beyond it. Um, one of the guys who I'm very close to, you, you begin to get very close with these people, as I sense Laura did also, um, he went back to Buchenwald 66 years later for the first time, took his family. And when they got to Buchenwald, which is about five miles outside of Weimar, the classic German, classical German city, he walked into the gate and he stopped and his family didn't know what he was doing. And he turned around and he walked out. And then he walked in again. And then he walked out again. And he did this three times. And he turned to his family and said, I'm free. I'm finally free. I can walk in and out. I don't have to stay here anymore. Um, and what was happening was something therapeutic. Um, he'd written a memoir. He'd gone back to this place. And he was exercising the demons he carried for 66 years. With that, let's open it up for questions. Do raise your hand, and I think we'll uh, give you one of the microphones. And uh, so Joyce is going to come around to you. So we have a question right here in the back. This is an exercise program. I did this last time, so Joyce gets to do it this time. Yeah, I had a question um, for the defining uh, genocide. Um, what are like the, some of the steps you said, uh, you mentioned that uh, the USA was late in recognizing what genocide is and um, they haven't recognized the Armenian genocide or the genocide that occurred in, um, for the Native Americans. Are any steps being made towards um, the um, slavery movement, that how they were moved from Africa to not only America but across uh, the world? and uh, the internment camps of uh, the Japanese people that happened in World War II? Uh, yeah, you're kind of covering all the things I didn't have time to. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, those are, those are really good points. And um, something that's of, th that's of concern to us right now who study this is that th the U.S. still does not recognize the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court to, to try genocide cases. Um, my personal opinion about that is that the U.S. is reluctant to do that out of fear that they could be charged mm -hmm. with genocide. Um, you know, specifically, I think about Iraq and Afghanistan and Guantanamo. Um, so I think that the, the reluctance of the U.S. to sign on to a lot of these uh, agreements or even documents that recognize prior genocides is that our government fears being tried, and that I think is kind of a valid fear. But yeah, there are, there are many others that, that we talk about in class, about yeah, Japanese internment, slavery, that, that can all fit under definitions of genocide. Okay, next, oh, uh, Ken's gonna. Um, I have a concern about how we define genocide, and it's maybe a little bit different um, than Chris's. Uh, her presentation was really good in, in giving us a sense of what else we can call genocide. Um, but the direction of the question is that is to call even more things genocide. And my concern is that genocide be an analytical concept, not a, not a rhetorical device. If it's merely a rhetorical device that we throw at anything, mm -hmm. um, then it loses its moral power. Mm -hmm. um, and you won't get people responding with the kinds of actions we want to intervene against such things. So, so, so there's a burden on us, and it's a difficult burden, uh, about drawing the line around many of the things we talked about and saying those things inside that box are genocide 
and yet other things are bad and terrible and we oppose them, but they're not genocide, mm -hmm. right? And so when you say Iraq and Afghanistan, I think we can differ over that. I mean, occupation for uh, geopolitical reasons or, or, or that may or may not be genocide. Um, ethnic cleansing may or may not be genocide. If it leads to the physical destruction of the group, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, but if it's, sim it's simply moving from A to B, it may or may not be. So I, I have a concern, I think we should all have a concern, um, that we keep genocide a, a tough analytical concept and we reach some sort of conclusion. And of course, we're going to debate about many of these things. Yeah, I agree. And, and in the internment of Japanese Americans, there, um, there are, there are things about that process that are genocidal in some ways, at least the starting processes of genocide, but I don't believe the U.S. government had any intent to destroy the Japanese American population. I think that they were concerned about risk and safety and overstepped. But that particular incident, no, I, I, and I agree with Ken, this word is misused all the time, except when it seems most important to use it. But let me, let me ask a question, though. I mean, because of the way that, that Ken responded, we ran a huge risk in relation to uh, Sudan and Darfur, where we continued to dither over whether or not something was or was not genocide. And it almost became that it was a, there was a litmus test that had to be met before uh, action was at all implied. Mm -hmm. And is there a problem, I mean, I, I, I totally agree, Ken, that not everything is genocide, but do we run a risk of having a standard where instead, unless something is truly genocidal, then, then inaction is, is, is much more a, a deliberate kind of decision on the part of a state like the United States? See, I don't think the problem that prevents us from intervening successfully and uh, uh, beneficially in, in Darfur has anything to do with definitions. I think it has to do with power politics and who's for it and who's against it and who worries about the geopolitical uh, consequences of it. Um, in fact, in, in that particular case, we defined it as genocide quite early. And we did it under a Republican president, uh, which was quite surprising. Um, but that didn't get us to act. Um, so the problem about action is, is a problem of international politics um, and, and not of, of, of the right definition. Okay, we've got a question right over here. Hold those hands high so Joyce can see you. Um, uh, on the subject of the Japanese, um, could you not make a point in saying that at least not only in internment camps in the United States, but the way we handled uh, post-World War II relations with Japanese people, um, kind of like some of the policies we implemented, um, such as making the emperor of Japan kind of admit to not being God and kind of cultural things that we stepped a little too far in, couldn't those be perceived as, I don't know, cultural genocide or at least like a, a kind of an attack on a way of life that, I don't know, seems kind of excessive? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, and, and, and I'm unfamiliar with, with U.S.-Japan relations post-World War II, so I'm hesitant to comment decisively on something that I don't know a lot about, but, I mean, I, I think a lot of that goes back to what Ken said about international politics. I think that um, post-World War II, as the victors, the U.S. probably overstepped in a lot of ways, as did other allied countries. Um, there's some really interesting work that's been done by a man named Greg Stanton, who has laid out kind of the stages of genocide that starts with the simple process of othering, thinking about someone as being different from you. And eventually that simple us versus them starts to create a, a divide and a huge chasm where the groups become polarized. And according to Stanton, if steps aren't taken, eventually genocide will occur. So, yeah, not, not being familiar, I wish I could answer more uh, authoritatively, but I'm, sh you know, I think the the international politics behind that particular incident are very, very important. Okay. Other questions over here, Joyce. It's not so much a question; it's kind of more a comment. Because what I've noticed from this discussion, um, when you throw around the term gen genocide, to me, it kind of minimizes it. Because when, um, like, going back to Arizona and what's going on in Arizona, and how you like mentioned that that's leading to possible genocide. Um, I do think it's very bad, but I like 
agree with the awareness and what the government has to do because to me genocide like I think of the Holocaust I think of like the Armenian genocide like those were awful and yes what's happening with the immigrants in like Arizona I just think like throwing around the term genocide and using it so loosely really minimizes what an actual genocide is so. Yeah, uh, well, I agree, and I'm not saying that we are, we are, you know, I'm not saying that there's an active genocide going on against illegal immigrants in Arizona, but I'm concerned about those stages that continue to progress to more and more serious things. And so I think that if you start yelling genocide too soon, you're right. People say, what, are you crazy? That's not happening down here. It's more important to me that we try to point out similarities between what's happening in this country and other events that did lead to genocide to say, yeah, look, this is really, really bad. Um, and I'm not sure where it's going to go. And it's, it's unlikely that there is an intent to destroy in Arizona. Um, but could it come to something like a forced relocation? You know, I don't know. But yeah. Like a forced relocation mm -hmm. as like genocide, like that's such a powerful wor like word it to is. some people. So I it was is. just like really surprised that that's part of the definition. It is, and yeah, I think they were they were trying to be broad to encompass a lot of different behaviors, and maybe we need to rethink some of those. Um, but I I don't know. Every forced relocation I've seen has led to thousands or millions of deaths that were intentional, and inflicted upon a group not necessarily because of what any one person did, but because of what they represented or the fact that they were just problematic or scapegoats for, for the larger society. But this is, this is a great debate because this is what genocide scholars can't agree on either. I mean, you should be on our listserv. These people fight over this stuff like you wouldn't believe it, and they're all professors. But yeah, there's a lot of disagreement and a lot of discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've got uh, one right here, Joyce. See right here? Oh, and over there then. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering how and why you found that when um, immigration goes up, crime goes down. What were the statistics on that and why do you think that occurs? Um, you know, I have to review it. I, it's been a while since I looked at it, but the, it's all based on longitudinal data where um, researchers who do that kind of work look at, at crime rates over time and kind of overlay immigration over time as well. And I wish I could give you an answer, but I'm a little rusty on their exact findings. Um, but I remember in looking at that body of research thinking that the people responsible for it collected very good data and did very thorough analysis and it just, it just seems to be that as immigration increases in, into the U.S., right, so we're looking at a rate of immigration. During those, um, those periods of time, crime also goes down. The tricky part is what else could be causing that, right, and what do you control for? And I would be happy to look that up and let you know. <laughs> Okay. This now I'm going to let Joyce memory. just run the floor, Joyce, because you can see okay. him as well as I can. Um, just out of curiosity, I was wondering, after a genocide occurs, like in the case um, in Rwanda, who's responsible for punishing the people who are responsible for it? Would it be like the Rwandan government, or is it an international UN situation? Both, all three. Yeah, we can probably all answer that. But yeah. Why don't you start? And then in, in Rwanda, the um, mechanism that's in place um, for the planners of genocide ha are taken to Arusha, to a, an international tribu tribunal. Um, but because so many ordinary people were involved, it's impossible to try everyone um, through that mechanism in Arusha. So in Rwanda, they have put into place what has been a traditional court system called gachacha, where there are community courts that are set up and the community members come. Um, there are wise people who are designated to be running the process in the community and the um, perpetrators, the people who are accused, who are held right now in jails in Rwanda are brought forward and people in the community face them and say what they have experienced, what they saw, what they heard, and so on. Um, the idea behind it is actually that in, 
in opposition to a sense of punishment. Instead, they're trying to reintegrate. In Rwanda, what's different than most um, genocides is that Hutu and Tutsi are currently living side by side. They've continued to live in the same country together. And so the effort is actually to try to get the community to function, to bring the um, folks who have been involved in genocide back into the community um, and to have a punishment that is restorative justice rather than um, punitive justice. Um, well, in East Timor, there's a number of different mechanisms that have been used. And part of the problem in the case between East Timor and Indonesia is that you have the case where many of the people who are working with Indonesia went to Indonesia Indonesia is a sovereign country. East Timor is now an independent country. However, it is a very small, poor country in many respects next to a very large neighbor with whom it shares a land border. So obviously it is very difficult for the smaller country of Timor to say, we'll bring you to our courts, although that's at some level what the international community proposed in designing what are called hybridized, hybrid internationalized tribunals with the model that if you had a special panel of the court in Dili, Timorese would be able to see the, the trial and that would have some therapeutic effect as opposed to just taking people to The Hague and trying them before an international court there. The problem was that Indonesia, for fairly obvious reasons, didn't send over all of its high-ranking military to face trial and um, the international community had a lack of political will to make them stand justice. Um, and at a certain point, this is where the, the whole Timorese were victims of other Timorese comes up and people have really focused on um, the reintegration of people who committed what are called non-serious crimes, which could be burning somebody's house down, stealing all their livestock, because those are the people who have to live side by side and have pretty much sort of, I mean, no one has given up, but there it, it seems that the the international political will was um, spent on having UN peacekeeping forces, which many people have said, well, you know, yes, genocide was averted, we have independence, so let's move on and go forward. Although again, in terms of accountability, that has not solved the problem. And one other thing which people have also tried to consistently remind the UN of was that the people who were killed were not just Timorese, there were actually uniformed people as part of the UN mission designed to safeguard the election who were killed by the Indonesian forces and those people have not been tried either. But there's been, there's been a mix, a range of, of trials. Um, and there's a whole field called transitional justice where people have tried to weigh the options between what do we do after something like this, particularly where the state was involved and what effects will it have long-term on respect for rule of law? And at one earlier point, there was the idea that you could have either truth or justice. So you'd have a truth commission where we'd get the whole truth, but we would forego justice. And the most famous case is South Africa, where the idea was you would get amnesty if you would disclose all of the political motivations of your crimes. Now the thinking is that, that things have to be sequenced so that you have to have some truth telling, some reconciliation, some sometimes amnesties will promote human rights and that it, it depends on a whole range of um, factors. There is a I think we'll take one last question if we may. We have right over there, Joyce? Or, okay, then we'll take two last questions since you saw both. Um, out of curiosity, has the U.S., um, two questions. First, has the U.S. Um, had any hand in punishing other genocides? And second, if the U.S. were to ad, um, potentially admit to their own crimes, um, would that have an effect on their um, helping out with the punishment of other genocides? Um, well, let's see. Ken might be better to answer this than I, than, than, than I can because the U.S. played a major role in the Nuremberg no. trials post-World War II. Um, I'm racking my brain now. I mean, the international community now has created tribunals, as, uh, as, um, as Dr. Apol pointed out, the, the ICTR um, was created by the UN, the ICTY, the International 
criminal tribunal for U the former Yugoslavia was created by the UN. And I, I don't know the US's role in those, but I do know that they have not been, an, that they have not agreed to the uh, International Criminal Court, which was created to try mm -hmm. pretty much everything else right. after Bosnia and Rwanda. I can't think of any other active role they've had, maybe in Cambodia. The Cambodian, a big no. Cambodian trial started yesterday. It's um, UN. That's, that's totally UN. I don't know the what, United States has been standoffish about all these international juridical yeah. agencies and is not a part of them. And, and the interesting thing is that if you look at the justices who populate mm -hmm. them, um, many of them were boys in the camps, just like the Buchenwald boys I'm writing about. Thomas Bergenthal is one. Mm -hmm. um, there's another guy who's an lawyer, international lawyer at NYU, uh, Meron. This is his last name. Um, they're all boys who are in the camps. Um, the United States was involved in post-war justice, I, I use quotation marks, after the Nazi genocide, but in a very uh, superficial and shallow way. Uh, Nuremberg looked only at the top elite mm -hmm. of the Nazi regime, and it only drew on documentary evidence. Right. They made the same distinction that I was exploring in my presentation, they didn't believe testimony meant anything. Um, so they, they only used documents and they used uh, um, testimony if it would be about Nazi decision making, but not testimony about the actual experience of people going through genocide. It was only until um, the Eichmann trial in Israel where they brought forward about 100 survivors to talk about their experience that we begin to get something like what we would call truth telling. Um, where human beings talked about what it was like to go through this. And it opened up a lot of people's eyes because um, they, they didn't understand what it meant to live in a ghetto. They didn't understand what it meant to live in a camp. They didn't understand anything about this gray zone mm -hmm. where people were forced into choiceless choices. That's the phrase in, in, in the field in which I work about, uh, where, where you have bad choices. You don't have moral choices. Right. Um, you live in a completely different moral universe and you're forced to choose among uh, terrible choices. Um, so we have a lot to learn about transitional justice. Yeah. Um, and it's mostly happening elsewhere in the world, um, not from our own country. Although Detroit has just initiated a panel on race that is modeled with some Truth Commission backgrounds. and. Um, one of our colleagues in the Residential College of the Arts and Humanities is going to be on it. Mm. Estella Torres, yeah. Mm. Wow. There was also a panel um, for some uh, killings in Greensboro, North Carolina that followed a Truth Commission format. So it is a technique that's being used here. Okay, now we do have one last question and we have some last finishing things and then we will be soon to go. Uh, I'm kind of wondering what would you suggest uh, to promote like awareness of genocide, not just awareness, kind of stepping beyond that, um, and what would be the like, next steps beyond, beyond just getting people to, to know about this? Actually, I have all my students, not this semester, you guys got out of this requirement because I'm keeping you busy enough, but my ISS students usually do a project that's focused on public awareness and they, they um, select a current event and I encourage them to use YouTube and social media and Twitter to try to get the word out. Um, part of the problem is, you know, this, this definitional mm -hmm. issue. I mean, you can certainly say horrible things are happening. You have to be careful how you use the word genocide. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate, I think, that our government in, here in this country hasn't been outspoken enough about international issues. That's my opinion more than scholarship. <laughs> Other comments on that question? Next steps? Well, and I do last, see a- last question? Hmm? Is that a last, last question? <laughs> no, that's the last Next question. Step. Well, you had your hand up and you're the last one. <laughs> so if anybody wants to talk to him later, feel free. Okay, you're up. Uh. Last, last. Uh, this is just kind of a general question. Um, everybody on the board. Do you feel that part of the reasoning behind broadening the definition of the word genocide is to avoid offending groups of people? Because um, they don't want the tra tragic events that's happened to those people to be belittled. Does that make sense? I'm not 
not sure. I mean, are, so are you talking about like not wanting to use the word genocide because survivors of the Holocaust might feel like the yeah, like that maybe word isn't valid. Maybe um, as you're saying before, like getting the word minimalized, or um, if we don't use it for another event, those people are like, well, why is their event worse? Kind of. Mm -hmm. Why does it rise to the level of genocide here, yeah. but not over here? Yeah. 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 Um, I think, you know, people are afraid to use it. We call it the G word sometimes. A um, man named Raphael Lemkin pretty much gave his life in, in devotion to creating this word and to making sure that the U.S. government knew about it and used it and adopted it. And um, I think some of the, some of the power that it has makes governments afraid to use it. And then there's this, as I mentioned earlier, this ongoing debate between scholars. What is it? Um, and you know, as, as we've all been talking tonight, it, that there's just a lot of debate and discussion about what constitutes genocide and, and what doesn't. As I pointed out in the UN definition, there are lots of things you could scoop in, but do we really want to do that? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky issue, and, and I think that there, that there has to be some awareness of the impact on victims of prior genocides when you start thinking about it. Kim? Yeah, um, if you listen to the way each of us made our presentation, it's really interesting. Um, each of us has to, in order to do the work we do, plumb down deeply in a particular place, in a particular genocide. Um, so you, you have to go to East Timor and speak to people there. You have to go to Rwanda and speak to people there. You've got to find survivors willing to speak and gather all their testimony. So. A, a, a lot of what we do is focus on the particular and the specific. And then having this conversation about genocide and what are its boundaries is a constructive next step because then we begin to say, okay, what's common in, in the stories that we're, uh, we're putting together? What's, what's different? What's distinctive? And begin to make those kinds of comparisons and learn something about it. But we then differ over what's comparable with what else. Right? So it's, it's a fraught kind of enterprise. Um, and there are some people who think uh, the genocide they study is bigger, was greater in scale, involved more people um, than another genocide. So it can get heated every once in a while. But nonetheless, putting um, this comparative frame around it enables us to see what works in all these things. What's common? What are the elements? And hopefully uh, the, the anticipation is that makes them makes us better able to spot things that are happening and better able to respond to things as they occur. And let me just uh, uh, ask us all, first of all, to thank our panelists one more time, please. <laughs> and before we all go, uh, let me just uh, make a couple of, of quick closings. Number one, uh, I'd like to thank all the co-sponsors and the Honors College is dedicated to the notion that cross-disciplinary discussion is good for all of the professors involved and we hope that it's good for you as well. Also the thing to keep in mind is that all four of your presenters tonight are on our campus here at Michigan State University so you can take courses from them, you can email them with your additional questions, you can get in touch if you have a desire to stand on the side of of uh, uh, truth and reconciliation on the one side, restorative justice, the power of poetry, and the power of history in all of these different uh, uh, situations and in future situations. Our hope is that many of you in the room one day will be diplomats that are going to be making decisions, are going to at least be citizens that are going to be making decisions. The reason we need to understand genocide across time and space is because it's not only a historical artifact. That is, we need to understand that it moves from place to place and it moves into each new era and, in t and sometimes in very, very frightening and unfortunately new ways. So our hope is that you found this at all interesting. I hope that all of you have signed in so that you're on our mailing list. We will be doing two more of these uh, kinds of uh, transdisciplinary forums in the spring. Uh, they're going to be on different topics. And if you sign up tonight, we'll make sure that you are, get uh, notice of that. Also check the state news and uh, the various other uh, 
uh, media outlets because of the fact that we will be announcing these. And these only work because you come. So thank you so much for coming tonight. Make sure you eat all the cookies so none of us <laughs> grab them on the way out. Okay? Thanks so much thank for coming. Thank you.